you know, when I was asked to speak, um, I thought I'll speak on Pandita Ramabai. I, I wasn't sure at that stage uh, why I did that, except that I feel that uh, there is a relevance to our times, particularly because uh, uh, in recent days, because of the pandemic and the work uh, and the crisis of labor, I was reminded of Pandita Ramabai myself because she did a lot of intervention uh, in distress times. So she's been in my mind uh, for other reasons. Um, but also now I discover that it is the 100th year of her death. So 1922 is when she died and we are in 2022. Um, so actually it's, uh, it's an interesting uh, uh, coincidence that has, uh, that has happened. And I think it's important for, uh, for us to recall her uh, and, her, and her early uh, interventions in feminism uh, because, you know, in a sense, recovering our own history is um, critical. Uh, I want to begin by saying that um, I went to uh, study Maharashtra, although I was not a scholar of uh, Maharashtra. Uh, I had begun by writing an essay, a long essay called Whatever Happened to the Vedic Dasi, in which Pandita Ramabhyay appeared at the very end of the essay. Um, and... Uh, that had been written based basically on 19th century reformers and their uh, and their construction of the uh, ancient past. Uh, there was a lot of material that I had used from the Bengal reformers because they were the ones who were kind of leading the leading the pack uh, early on in um, uh, in the from the 19 uh, sorry 1820s 30s 40s onwards they. They are the ones who were actually promoting the reform. So in a sense, when you write the history of women and women's reforms, uh, Bengal, you're forced to confront uh, Bengal because that's where much of the sources are. But I also could see that the limitations of focusing on Bengal, because in Bengal, I don't know if you all know this, you should know this, um, including the Marxists, everybody said, there is no caste. In Bengal, there is no caste, you know? We, we, we dealt with caste. It was a refusal to acknowledge caste as a uh, basic fault line uh, um, in Indian society. And I was uh, very convinced that if I have to study, um, if I have to write about um, gender from a perspective of our uh, history and our texts, I would have to deal with Brahmanic Hinduism. So it was, there's no question that I could escape from uh, uh, thinking about Brahmanic Hinduism. And so I decided that the one place where already a body of um, writing existed, which was exploring caste um, in very vibrant ways was Maharashtra. So people like Gail Lombard and so on had already written about uh, the caste uh, 19th century and caste question in the 19th century. And I knew that if I have to look at uh, indigenous forms of patriarchy, then I will have to confront uh, a Brahmanical Hinduism. And therefore, it, it seemed to me important for me to study, go to a place where I could see that being contested uh, in the early part of our reformist history. And so that's the reason why I chose to move to Maharashtra and I located myself in thinking of giving Ramabai, uh, using Ramabai as a point of entry to explore uh, what was happening in the 19th century in, uh, in Maharashtra. Uh, in fact, one of my, an early um, uh, review of my book uh, by uh, well-known media, person called Pam Philippos uh, complained that why did I have Ramabai come only at the very end of the, uh, of the book, that there was this, she was confined to the last chapter because I spent a lot of time trying to look at 18th century Brahman, Brahmanical Hinduism, then 19th century changes, and then questions of um, reform and debate, uh, education, legal changes and stuff. And then finally I came to Ramabai's own life. Um, so in a sense, they, I was trying to, 
place Ramabai and her life and her uh, controversies in the context of a larger history. And that is what I tried to do in the, uh, in the book. So there's a lot of time that I have spent in examining um, the context for Pandita Ramabai's uh, extraordinary life and the extraordinary uh, controversies that she got into because she was a very controversial figure. Um, so that's how I went to uh, write this book. Uh, it took me many years, uh, I think uh, uh, almost eight years of collecting material and finally uh, three years of writing. And, and, and that's how I wrote this book. Um, and I think it's got a certain relevance both for historians as well as for literature uh, people, especially uh, you're all a group of literary figures uh, that is to understand the context of writing itself. Who writes, what, what do they write, and when do they write, and what kind of issues are, do they flag? And you see that in the uh, very powerfully in the 19th century history. So that's my reason for focusing on uh, Pandita Ramabai, apart from the fact that she, um, this is also her, the death centenary year. Uh, she, Pandita Ramabai never got her place in history. Uh, and, and when we uh, never got her place in history, she was a very controversial figure. And you'll find that the history of social reform in India has been written without reference to women and what they were saying about social reform. It's a completely male history. It begins with uh, Raja Ram Mohan Roy. It goes on to Ishwar Chandra Vidyasagar. Then it goes to the age of consent debates. Uh, it's all very Bengal centric and it is extremely male in its, uh, in its uh, uh, focus. So we don't actually get to know of what women were thinking, what they were saying and how they were intervening in the debates of their time. But when you go to Maharashtra, you see a different configuration. There is, uh, there is uh, interesting writing that women uh, have left behind. And that gives us a clue to the fact that there were a lot of women who were also participating in the questions of reform of Indian society. Uh, they have not been, uh, you know, they have not been, uh, they, they have not been uh, given their uh, due place in either the reformist uh, history or even in the uh, history of, uh, uh, let's say, the uh, emergence of the uh, women's question. Uh, now, see, when we um, uh, look at Pandita Ramabai, uh, the reason for her controversy, the, why she, all women were ignored, okay. But Pandita Ramabai in particular needed to be almost taken out of history, taken out of the um, framework of uh, uh, serious thinking because of her conversion. Her conversion became a very important element, uh, conversion to Christianity became a very important element of assessing her. And so Pandita Ramabai was actually um, completely excised from uh, the reformist debates and from uh, writing about, and it, this was, ex it, it was very interesting because in contrast, you'll find a lot of references to Annie Besant. Annie Besant is regarded as a nationalist. Annie Besant is regarded as a great, um, intervener in Indian. Uh, Annie Besant was extremely conservative. Uh, she didn't believe in uh, the reform of the widow's question. She actually thought that the widow, sacrificial widow was a good thing. Uh, it upheld uh, Hindu society's ideals and stuff like that. So it's a strange situation. And so there is a kind of mirror contrast. Here is this Indian woman who became Christian. And in, that is Ramabai. And in contrast, you have Annie Besant who this Irish woman that is from a Europe, white woman who comes to India and then throws herself into the, uh, into the independence movement in India and also is fairly conservative in her assessing, assessment of the uh, need for reform of Hindu society. In fact, she thinks that Hindu society is all right. She even included, I mean, she, she was outrageous enough in my opinion to uphold the endogamous marriage system that is marriage within the caste as a way of genetically mod retaining the purity of the communities. So you can imagine how uh, how um, radical uh, how radical someone 
uh, like Ramabai could be, who in, in uh, some 20, 30 years ago, before Annie Besant came on the scene, uh, had married uh, outside of the endogamous community. She actually, um, uh, she was a Chitpavan Brahman woman, but she married a Bengali so from the, what is called the Shudra caste. She made a, uh, what do you call it? A controversial marriage to a non-Brahmin, which is quite extraordinary for her times, because it's like hardly, you know that how much violence there is around these marriages today. So here's a woman who does that, but because she converted to Christianity, she got damned by uh, the nationalists and nobody paid too much attention to her. I have to say that even I, when I began, you see, I'm that generation of feminists uh, and people who have the luxury of being from a upper caste educated uh, household who can turn around and say, I don't believe in this or that or the other. You know, I can turn around I, and my generation, some of us were, were doing that. Uh, but we did not, you know, in, in a sense, uh, and, the, and we always regarded ourselves as secular humanists rather than as needing religion of any kind, which made even someone like me uncomfortable with the fact that Ramabai converted and she converted to Christianity. So you can see how the baggage of history works itself out even in other generations. So I was a little, um, let's say, somewhat unsympathetic to Ramabai's need to convert to, uh, to Christianity. And this, to my mind, is a, was completely wrong because I was not sympathetically understanding uh, Ramabai's own location in her own time in Brahmanical Hinduism, uh, which she felt she had to break with. No, so, it, so it took me a lot of time. It took me a lot of time to actually go back to 19th century Mahara history in Maharashtra and to locate Ramabai as well as other, uh, other uh, women writers of her time in a context which was actually untainted by these, uh, these kind of uh, critical gaze that I was bringing to them. I want to say this because uh, in a sense, I shared some of the, shared some of them. I mean, I, I felt religion was irrelevant. Um, like a lot of people uh, do uh, feel that uh, religion is irrelevant. And a lot of early feminists did think that religion is the location of so much of the, uh, uh, of the patriarchal baggage. So in a sense, religion, we were critical of religion per se. Uh, so this also made me uncomfortable with uh, Ramabai as a person. It took me a long time to shed that and to look at um, to look at Ramabai as a figure who should be uh, assessed based on her own personal experiences and on the choices that she made in her time, which were very rational choices in my opinion, emotional to some extent, but they were also very rational choices. So in a sense, that's how uh, I proceeded to engage with Pandita Ramabai. Uh, now, let's uh, start with what was the context for Ramabai's own social and, uh, social and economic and political location. Uh, the, that actually is, you have to go back to 18th century Maharashtra history. Uh, in fact, the history of Pune, because this is all happening in the heart, this, this part of Pune, as you might remember, might know, uh, if you're historians or if not, you should, uh, that Pune came, uh, uh, that part of Maharashtra was actually uh, uh, penetrated by the colonial power only as late as 1818, which is like 100 years uh, or so before uh, some of these people, or, or say 50, 60 years before some of these people were born and were living. Uh, now, Pune, as the heartland of uh, Brahmanical Hinduism, Maharashtrian Brahmanical Hinduism, uh, was an extremely uh, unique formation because it had survived. Uh, it, the Peshwas, I, I don't, I'm not sure about uh, how much of the history we all know, but the Peshwas had taken over power from the Marathas 
and the Peshwas were Brahmins. And the Peshwas in the 18th century uh, ensured that a very conservative form of Brahmanical Hinduism was being practiced and promoted by the Pune state, by the uh, Peshwai. It was called the Peshwai. The Peshwai was a very Bra Brahmin oriented state. And we are lucky that uh, historians have uh, studied that state. Uh, this uh, brilliant work of a person called uh, Hiroshi Fukuzawa uh, is something that people should read because he has actually looked at the documents in the Pune archives uh, and uh, has been able to map an extraordinary connection between uh, caste and gender actually in the 19th century, uh, 19th century, 18th century uh, Peshwai Brahmanical state. And among the things that he talks about is that when the, um, when the Peshwas were ruling, they ensured uh, and reintroduced a very conservative form of Brahmanical Hinduism to operate in the, uh, in the state. For instance, um, if they heard that um, some father had allowed, some father or some brother had allowed the widow in his family to retain her hair, and not shave it off. You imagine the nature of the state, how despotic and how pervasive it was. The if the if this information reached the Peshwa, he would immediately send an order saying that the male members of that household should ensure that the rules of Brahmanical Hinduism were being practiced as far as the uh, widowhood was concerned. So it is a very surveilling, very powerful state that was penetrating into the lives of people. And so gender was one thing that they were policing, but caste also they were policing. So if there were attempts at moving up or down in the caste system, that too was being policed by the uh, Peshwai. Uh -huh. By the Peshwai. So uh, it's a very, uh, it's a I mean, yeah. uh, for us to understand uh, what is the con context you have to actually tell people to mute themselves. So this this state this kind of state um, uh, is uh, it's important for us to recognize that um, surveillance control and so on were not introduced only by the British colonial state it existed in the Peshwai and the Brahmanical Hinduism is a form of uh, surveillance you must remember. I mean the outcasting system for instance you um, excommunicate members of the of particular families if they don't conform these are all practiced by brahmanical hinduism and so it is a very repressive form of um, policing both caste and gender in the uh, in the 18th century itself now that is the context for 19th century social reform so when the 19th century social reform comes or when we try and look at what what the choices are for someone like uh, pandita ramabai we must remember what we are evoking. Now, uh, I'll refer you to the fact okay, uh, uh, that um, there is this young woman called uh, Mukta by Salve, who was a uh, student, a class, a 13-year-old student in Jyotiba Phule's School for Girls. You might all know by now that the one of the reformist things that happened in the 19th century is that Someone at Jyotiba Phule actually set up the first school for girls. And this non-Brahman, Mali, that is um, belonging to the Gardner caste, um, sets up the school and young women come to it. And this Dalit girl, Mahar, uh, Mang girl, she's actually a Mang, uh, uh, the lowest caste that you can possibly think of. She is a student in the school. And one of the short essays that she's written uh, one of the uh, ent interesting things that the women writing in India uncovered for a English reading public at least uh, was uh, this women's writing in various languages. And one of the, this essay by uh, Muktabai uh, 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 Salve is included in it. It's a short essay in which she describes the state of the Dalits in her time, in, uh, at her time. And it's a very powerful account of the oppression of the Brahmins uh, and the control of Brahmins over um, all of society. 
uh, it's a very, very powerful piece of writing. Uh, it's, um, and when you think that she's a 13 year old, you also see that what Phule was trying to do in, as part of the 19th century reform, which hasn't been given enough attention in my opinion, uh, is that he's actually trying to go beyond the idea of mere education. Now, I, I, I think education was a very important element of 19th century reform. Those of you who are from, um, uh, even in uh, Andhra, you will all know that basically all the reformers were talking about widow remarriage uh, or um, uh, reducing the oppression of uh, widows. And the other hand, they were also talking about education, uh, including education for women. So these are the two twin um, uh, axes of uh, uh, social reform that uh, across many parts of India they were uh, promoting. But Phule alone was actually doing something more, much more interesting. He was, uh, he wrote, he wrote and wrote and wrote using traditional forms basically. Um, so he wrote Pawaras, he wrote uh, um, forms of writing which were popular in his region. And among the things that he wrote is a, an essay called, uh, 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 an essay or a piece of writing called Trutya Ratna, that is the third eye, uh, the third, Th the third gem, Ratna, uh, but the third eye. And he's talking about what education should actually mean for people. And what is it? It's meant to be the opening of the analytical eye, this third eye. See, the, the, the two eyes are the ones that we see with. But that is what is the form, the exterior. The third eye is meant to unravel the uh, hidden agenda or the go beyond the, what the eyes can see to analyze what it is seeing in a proper perspective through a, uh, an understanding. So knowledge, knowledge, real knowledge uh, is the third eye, not you know, simply the uh, learning the ABCDs or learning the Gakaga is not the uh, main uh, um, agenda of, the, uh, of education. So this kind of writing it is very powerful because Mukta Bhai Salve is, ex is actually exhibiting this analytical eye because she actually argues about the oppression of the Dalits in the, under the Peshwai. And she makes a very strong critique of the Peshwai. So you can see that um, Maharashtra is, uh, parts of Maharashtra are in ferment. They are in a state of uh, unsettlement. And um, uh, all of these people are playing a role in creating that awareness. So, so there's, uh, uh, so it's a very exciting time. And if you understand what is happening, and if you try and understand uh, what was the differences between different people in the way they promoted reform. So the Brahman reformers, the male reformers, they were also promoting reform but they were promoting reform in a very limited way. So if you look at the famous uh, M.G. Ranade, the famous judge who went on to become a judge in the end, but a great reformer, um, his wife has left behind a memoir, which is called Himself. That is, she's basically write, written an autobiography of herself, but it's an autobiography of the husband. Uh, and it's called Himself. And she proceeds to um, uh, write her experiences of marriage and uh, um, and uh, the work that she did for uh, women's reform. Uh, what is very interesting in this piece of writing is that you see how limited the agenda is for uh, many Brahmin uh, thinker, many Brahmin uh, reformers who came on the scene. Uh, they wanted in instrumental education, learning. So you need to learn uh, formally but they are not actually interested in you using your own power of analysis, your own understanding. And this is where the critical difference between the Pule uh, school and the reform that happens elsewhere is concerned. For instance, um, uh, uh, Ranade's wife, she was also a Ramabai. Ramabai Ranade actually writes saying, um, and she goes down in history as famous for the fact that she describes her marriage to um, Justice Ranade. He became justice later on. Um, he, his, his, he wants his wife to be a companionate wife. Now this is the obsession of men at that time. They are a new class. 
they don't want the old fashioned wives who are uneducated, who can't uh, share with them, uh, who can't join them in their reading and their uh, literary pursuits and so on. It's, very, it's a very in uh, interesting agenda. That is, you, uh, they're complaining. Some of them are complaining and saying, uh, you know, we read Shakespeare, we read um, uh, various uh, people like that, but we have no one to share it with. Now you must uh, understand what's happening in the 19th century that suddenly now the household is becoming the space in which a man must spend all his life. He doesn't go out uh, very much after that. He's meant to be the companionate model of marriage is being promoted. And so there is a, there is a way in which if you, the men are educated and the girls, women are not, then there is the domestic space is one which is uneven and you can't share the idea of a companionate wife. The wife who is a companion to you uh, is emerging uh, at that point of time. So it's a very interesting moment. And uh, I'll just read to you a little passage from uh, a man who's complaining and saying, um, you know, we are frustrated. We men are frustrated because we don't have a companion of the kind that the English have. So <laughs> you see, uh, so there's this man, he's uh, bemoaning, where is the Hinduani, wise and pure, who can quote Shakuntala and the merchant of Venice, play the sitar or the sarangi and sing divinely? Every educated Hindu would like to have such a kumud in his life. This kumud is the heroine of Saraswati Chandra, the famous Gujarati novel called Saraswati Chandra. Uh, such a lovely maiden for his wife. But where are these phantoms of delight in Hindu society? They exist in the brains of those who have read Kalidas and Shakespeare, but otherwise we know, know them not. And so this, here's this man complaining, saying that I'd, you know, we're, we're, uh, I'm looking for a wife of this kind. I'm looking for a partner of this kind. So there's this obsession with teaching, uh, uh, teaching your wife, at least the um, making them literate so that they can read with you. But even Justice Donna Day is so controlled and uh, having taught his wife both Marathi and then later on uh, introduces her to English, he controls her reading. So she describes how they read together, but they read Ramana, they read this and that and the other. They do not read Pule, who's writing like mad at that same time. You know, Pule is, uh, as I just pointed out, he's writing, he writes and writes and writes. He writes different forms. Uh, but that's not re writing that the, this middle-class um, professional uh, Brahmin uh, emerging, um, administrative classes uh, is uh, reading. Uh, they are shunning that and the wife is certainly not allowed to read, read any of that. So you see that it's a very narrow controlled agenda. It is not something that in which even as you advocate reform, you do not, um, uh, you, you do not unfurl the real meaning of education, which is to think for yourself and to be able to analyze and to be able to uh, read of your own choice and make the judgments that you want to. Yeah, so this is interesting. This is an interesting limitation of the reformers. And yet there are people, and I think we should quickly go to them, apart from, um, apart from Mukta Bai Salve, Savitri Bai Pule herself writes, uh, she wrote poetry. Um, she's very much part of the reformist agenda and she does plays a lot of uh, role in that. But there is another very powerful piece of writing, which I don't know if you people know, and which I'm not sure exists in a translation in, um, in, uh, uh, in uh, Telugu. Uh, it's worth finding out. And this is um, Tarabal Shinde's uh, polemical piece of writing called Stri Purush Tulna. She's a very angry woman and, and she writes, she's a Maratha woman, she's, so she's non-Brahmin. Um, and she is outraged at the fact that there is a debate around a Brahmin widow who is charged with killing her child, uh, illicitly, uh, illicit within quotes, uh, produced child. Uh, there's a huge controversy. The pages of the uh, Marathi newspaper are filled with this um, condemnation for this Brahmin widow. 
and it's so severe and it's so outrageous that Tarabai Shinde is furious and she writes Stri Purush Tulna, which is her polemic against men, double standards of men in, uh, by, um, because of this incident. And she turns around and she says, hey, you're all getting so excited about this, this Brahmin widow who's supposed to have committed a crime. What about the man? Where is the man in all this? There was obviously a man who uh, was responsible for the pro procreation. He's left out of the debate. So there's a, so she writes this um, very angry uh, small book, which is called Sri Purush Tulna. And what is interesting is that the one person who defends it, everybody's furious with Tarabai Shinde because it seems to them that she's uh, vitriolic about the reform, uh, but, but, uh, you know, the class of men as a whole. Um, but what's interesting is that Pule defends her and uh, uh, defends that piece of writing. Um, and so this is the context in which we have to place Pandita Ramabai, which is how far can you go with the reform of, uh, you know, reformist agenda in society. Um, and in the end, she veers in the direction of, um, I mean, you know, there is uh, one of the things that we know from finally the limited uh, amount of um, intervention that is made in women's education and so on, is that you do actually find a lot of writing by women, which emerges uh, uh, by the second half of the, by the th uh, last quarter of the 19th century, there's a fair amount of writing that comes out and they're all discussing reform. Uh, they're all discussing the status of the widow in particular. Now this is, you, uh, um, those of you who are conversant with um, history and sociology will know that the ban on widow remarriage was a phenomenon for basically for the uh, Brahmins. Middle castes like the Marathas and Dalit castes did not ban the remarriage of widows. Okay, so remarriage of widows was banned for Brahmins um, and it has its own, you know, uh, in my Brahmanical, in my book on uh, gendering caste, there is a, a, an account of the uh, politics and the economics of the, of the ban uh, as it existed on, for different communities. But I'm not going to go into that for the, uh, for the moment. There will be no time. So we are faced with a situation where Ramabai, uh, where um, uh, uh, there is some voices are beginning to be critical. And it's in that context that we need to see Pandita Ramabai and her life and times. Uh, so she's born and she's born into a very, um, uh, her, her own location in Brahmanical Hinduism is very um, uh, well set in the sense that she's, her father was a uh, teacher uh, who uh, traveled around, uh, um, uh, he was something of a pilgrim. In his own way, he was a searcher of the truth and God. Uh, and he had an unconventional life because he believed that women should be okay, women should be educated, not barred from uh, learning. And so he began to teach his wife, his second wife, who was much younger than him. He began to teach her, and she in turn taught Ramabai because Ramabai was the, his youngest child. So she taught, and she taught her daughter uh, um, Ramabai. Uh, taught her Sanskrit because he was a scholar. He was a Sanskrit scholar. He was a, also Harikatha uh, practitioner. So, so here's this unusual family, which is not living in a village. It is traveling. The members of this household travel from one place to another. They uh, uh, sing Harikatha and they stay in, in a village at night and the village feeds them and then they move on to the next village and the next village and so on. So it's like a pilgrim uh, existence. And that's how Ramabai grows up. Um, she was born in 1858, just after the mutiny. And um, there is a marvelous photograph of uh, uh, the family, um, which I, I think is quite extraordinary because it does show you the very conventional, traditional Maharashtrian uh, family, which is not elite uh, and, and it's, um, it's uh, uh, appearance, as it were. What is significant is that um, the father, 
did not marry off his daughter. He had two daughters. He married his first daughter out uh, at the due age, uh, the older daughter. And he tried to bring the son-in-law into the household so that this boy would also be educated. It didn't work. And the elder daughter then was quite unhappy and she finally died. Uh, she died of uh, some, and she was oppressed in her husband's household. Um, and she died, uh, and Ramabai said it was good that she died because she was so unhappy in, the, in that uh, situation. Because of, the, in the, because of the bad experience of the elder daughter, Ramabai was never married. So she was not married at the age that all Brahmin young girls were married, which is to say before the age of 10, uh, um, clearly that kind of thing. And she becomes unique in the way she travels from one place to another to another. Um, along with her father, father uh, and mother and elder brother. So they are uh, a, a traveling um, uh, a teacher, a preachers, teachers, um, uh, storytellers, uh, Quranic storytellers. Um, and in this way, she has an extraordinarily rich life because if you travel, uh, you are immediately uh, extracted from that kind of narrow Brahmanical Hinduism that you would practice otherwise if you were living in a village and executing your normal social duties. So this is a very extraordinary moment in the life. But unfortunately, as they proceed, um, tragedy strikes. And this is where the um, social reform, uh, let's say the reformer uh, humanitarian persona of uh, Ramabai comes up um, is that there is, a, uh, there is a terrible famine in the Telugu Andhra country uh, with, through which the, uh, the family is traveling in the 1860s. And uh, there's no food. So there's no food. The father decides to do, uh, to decides not to eat and die like sannyasis sometimes do. Uh, and he goes like that. But the mother who is much younger uh, and the two children, the boy and the girl, uh, Ramabai and her brother, they are uh, struggling for food. Uh, Ramabai's mother does not, uh, is unable to withstand the rigors of the starvation. Uh, and at, and because, uh, because they're also Brahmins, they can't go and work. They cannot do manual labor. This is the, this is the social rules that exist at the time, and I, which at that time they are following. And finally, um, uh, but it's, it's, uh, the mother is uh, in a bad shape. So finally, Ramabai is desperate and she goes to the village and begs for a piece of roti from, uh, see, they, the, they were supposed to receive rather than go and beg. But she, she, she can't stand her mother, uh, mother's starvation. Uh, so she asks for the, this piece of budget. And she comes back with a piece of a bajri roti. And she gives it to her mother, but she can't, the mother cannot digest it at that time because she's been, she has starved for so long. Now, I don't know if, if, if all of you have know of this or uh, have heard of this, is that you cannot actually feed starving people with normal khana. You have to actually first introduce a kind of kanji into them uh, because their stomachs have, have, uh, have, have gotten are not used to digesting any longer. And so it takes a while for you to, so in the Bengal famine, um, they used to make this thin watery starch and that is what they fed people with to start with. And then you can give them rice or whatever thing. So the mother dies anyway, and it's a very tragic moment. So Ramabai describes how the mother dies, the father has already died. Um, and they need four people to take the, um, body to the to burn. They, this is not their village. They are traveling through mm, some region or the other. Uh, they find, including the, the brother Srinivas, they find two others. And Ramabai is the fourth person. She's so short that she, but she is required to um, to uh, be the fourth palbearer, the person on on whose head. And because she's small made the beer rests on her head, others lift it on their shoulder. And that is how 
uh, the mother is uh, given her funeral rites and whatever. So it's a very tragic moment. It's described with great feeling. Uh, there's also this whole sense of they are searching. They are actually searching for ultimate truth and realization, some way of surviving, as well as gaining knowledge. And this process is uh, described marvelously. Anyway, Ramabai and family then continued, uh, Ramabai and her brother continued the, in the, the so they are, they, she, she's left with father's gone, mother's gone, and only the elder brother is there, Srinivas, and they continue to travel. Now she, she this, uh, these travels are very interesting because in a sense, what Ramabai becomes is a kind of ethnographer of her own time. Uh, like, it's like she's traveling through these places and she's collecting all this information in her head um, because she's coming across different customs and so on. So many years later, and she puts it, deploys it very interestingly because many years later, uh, when the census, first census comes out, there is a description in that census of custom of uh, uh, the race, sex ratio in uh, Rajasthan is uh, very skewed because there are very few girls and there are many more boys. And the reason given for uh, this is the deaths of the child, the girl, girl child, uh, soon after she's born. Uh, and the reason given for the deaths of the ch uh, children is that the uh, animals have come in, hyena and so on have come and picked up the uh, ba girl babies and gone. And Ramabai, who's making an assessment of the census data, so many years later, she turns around and says, this is very strange that the hyena only picks up the girl babies. It doesn't pick up the boy babies. So, you know, she's making mocking at the argument uh, that is being presented in the, uh, in the, um, to the census uh, um, enumerators uh, as obviously it's patently false. It's like the arguments that we would make. I don't know if you, your generation actually had to do this, but in North India, when the women's movement first began, we had this spate of uh, uh, stove bursts. Uh, supposedly, young daughters-in-law were burnt to death in a stove burst. Uh, and we had to turn around and say, how strange that the stove only bursts in the hands of the daughter-in-law. It doesn't bur burst in the hands of the mother-in-law. So it's a sort of as crazy as that. You know, that is this uh, explanation given is clearly not uh, acceptable at all. And Ramabai has used her travel uh, understanding to uh, actually deploy uh, and to argue her point of view in the pieces of writing that she does. Anyway, I I'm not going to uh, uh, go, I, I don't think I have enough time to build the full story of Ramabai, uh, but I would like to just uh, take you to the fact that she is, she starts off life in a very uncontroversial way. So there are people are delighted with her, at least in Bengal. She appears finally, she and Srinivas go to Bengal and they meet Keshav Chandra Sen. Uh, they meet a, a number of the performers over there. And they're all delighted with her because she appears to them to be the manifestation of the Gargi and the Maitreyi of old times because she's learned and she knows Sanskrit. She knows Sanskrit, she, she's learned. Uh, and so she's hailed. That's when she gets the name of Pandita Ramabai Saraswati. Uh, that's the title that she's given at that stage. And so she's lecturing and so on. And it is significant because Keshav Chandra Sen, for instance, is um, telling her that uh, uh, she should read the Vedas. She said, but can I read the Vedas? Am I allowed to read the Vedas because she's a woman? Um, and he laughs because as a Brahmo Samaji, he's, they have opened up Vedas um, Upanishads and so on to uh, um, to general populations uh, leadership. So, uh, so this is the context in which she's initially she uh, meets with a very good reception, but then her brother dies, and when he too dies, then she makes this marriage to Bipin Bihari Medavi, and he is a non-Brahman, and she marries him even though she has a suitor who has traveled all the way from Maharashtra to press his case, a Brahmin man. Uh, she chooses um, uh, the uh, quote-unquote the Shudra 
um, Sutta uh, because he knew the brother. And uh, so there's a kind of trust that she has and she marries him. Unfortunately, her life uh, is full of misery because two years later, she has a little girl as a child and the, and the uh, husband also dies. Now she's left all by herself. So she returns to Maharashtra and that's when the, her life begins, her life as a reformer begins and her controversies escalate. So she lands up over there. Now everybody, she's met with uh, different types of reaction. The women, Brahmin women around her are all furious with her because they see her as uh, somehow um, upsetting the socialization that they've all been through. And um, so there's a very critical gaze that they uh, uh, charge her with, uh, assault her with. Over a period of time, Ramabai then, you know, decides to, she's, she's struggling. She's struggling because she has no means of livelihood. She has no economic um, uh, support mechanism. Uh, and while the uh, reformers may have invited her there, they are not actually going to really look after her. So she begins to write. Now, this is an important thing uh, from the point of view, you're all writers. It's, it's, I think she's the first known woman to write for a living. So she writes, and the first book she writes is a text, which is called uh, Stri Dharmaniti. It's a fairly conventional text because she's talking about the need for women the, uh, uh, to, be, uh, to uh, be socialized in a certain way that they are actually running progressive, um, progressive, uh, uh, performing for progressive roles as wives and mothers. Um, but even in, as she does that, so it's, it's a manual for what women should do. Um, but even there, she is displaying a certain amount of autonomy because she says if the husband is being led astray, he needs to be brought back to the path and so on. So that she's actually got a reformist notion of what the, uh, uh, of the uh, intelligent woman uh, as a wife should be uh, performing. The book is uh, considered to be very, um, very good because it schools women to think and behave in a certain kind of way. And the British government actually bought up all the copies of this book and distributed them in the schools to their to, to, to the school so that people would read this. So this is the first piece of writing that she does. And you see that it's not very radical. She, it, it is something that she, uh, but even there she's showing agency and she's not buying the rubbish of the uh, reformer men uh, telling us what to do. She is applying her own critical standards to what the intelligent woman um, should be doing and how she should be leading her life. But that's something that she, and it's with the money that she gets from there, that she is able to pay for her passage to go to England, where she hopes to be trained to be a doctor. Now, you know, in the 19th century, a lot of the women wanted to be doctors because that's the way you could help the condition of, uh, of um, help women. Um, and she goes uh, to England. Uh, she's received by um, uh, Anglican church members. She lives there and she, she thinks that she's going to teach and survive there on her own. But she's uh, disappointed to find, she meets Max Muller over there. Uh, but she's disappointed to find that she um, uh, cannot join the medical course because she's hard of hearing. Now, all those years in which she's traveling from place to place, they're sleeping on the damp ground and so on. So Ramabai was hard of hearing. Uh, in a, in a, in she, gradually, I think she lost mostly all of her hearing, but they will not take her into the, uh, into the course. So she's naturally disappointed and whatever it is. And it is here that she became, she converted to Christianity. And then in a sense, she damned herself uh, because she, by in, in the eyes of the, reformist, Hindu reformist, male, uh, upper caste uh, elites. Again, the only person who defends her is uh, Pule. Pule defends her and says, what else will women do except to leave, exit Hinduism? Because Hinduism is so oppressive to women. So in a sense, uh, the uh, idea of conversion 
of exiting a, a religion which you're not satisfied with is uh, visibly promoted. I'm quite, as a public figure, uh, the controversy sh most sharply defined in the case of uh, Pandita Ramabai. Anyway, now while she's there, um, but soon afterwards, the point is that she's an intelligent woman and she's not only an intelligent woman, she's a um, woman with agency, with her own agenda. And she soon gets into a controversy with the church, the colonial church, the Anglican church to which she has converted because she is supposed to teach English men who are coming out to India to be trained as their officers. And the Cardinal from India writes back and writes there saying she should not be allowed to do that because she will not be accepted back by her own people uh, if she teaches white men over there, you know? So Ramava is furious and she says, do I know my people better or does, he, does, does this English cardinal know the, uh, my people? My mother taught me and there was no open prophecy. So she's actually taking on the, um, the, uh, the church and its establishment. So this is one of the things I want to point out is that you may join a new faith. Okay, you may exit, but you don't exit patriarchy. And you can see the, the way in which patriarchy functions. Uh, also promotes itself in other uh, social, uh, in other uh, formation. So um, she gets into a controversy and she is marvelous in the use of intelligence, uh, argument, and ultimately when she's faced with uh, authority, she turns around and says, I will listen to my conscience. Now this is fantastic uh, at a time. She says, I, I don't care. I will only listen. I'll listen to my inner voice. And so my inner voice tells me something and I'll do it. So in a sense, Ramabai is, she may have moved from Brahmanic Hinduism to uh, Christianity, but she's still faced with patriarchal uh, uh, control. And it, this is one of the controversies that she is um, uh, uh, strongly, uh, what's it called, faced with in her life. Uh, she also travels later on to um, the US uh, where she does public speaking. Uh, she goes to meetings and she's talking about the condition of widows because she's trying to raise money for a widow's home that she will open in India when she returns. So she goes on a speaking tour. She goes from place to place and uh, collects a Ramabai Association, Friends of Ramabai Association. She's in traveling in the US at the same time that Vivekananda is traveling uh, after the uh, great address that he makes to the uh, Chicago uh, uh, con con uh, Conference of Religions. And they get into a confrontation because uh, she's, she's talking about the miseries of the, uh, of the widows in India and he's turning around and promoting it over there in the US saying he, he knows Indian society, he has traveled around and he can say with authority that no, no woman, uh, no widow in India is oppressed by anything at all. So you can see that, you know, the promotion and the lies that you tell in order to uh, promote a point of view is, some, is something that um, uh, is happening right there in the 1890s uh, in, uh, in the US. But significantly, even there, she's moving from one place to another. She goes to churches and she's sometimes speaking in the churches and she attacks the fact that the churches do not enroll women as clergymen. So she's very consistent in her promotion of the woman and the right of women to not only be educated, but to be in every particular sphere. And she's quite marvelous because while she's there, she meets a lot of reformers. She met Harriet Tubman, uh, the Negro reformer. Uh, and she writes letters. Uh, there are a marvelous set of letters called Letters and Correspondence of uh, Pandita Ramabai. She's writing many, some of those letters she's writing to her little daughter who has been left behind in England while she's traveling and gone on this speaking tour. Uh, and she's talk, and she describes to this little, little girl, <clears throat> she's doing this progressive education. She describes Harriet Tubman and the condition of the slaves in America and how Harriet Tubman has helped 
many slaves to escape from uh, from uh, from um, where they are, uh, uh, you know, where they're being exploited. Uh, so it's an extremely fascinating journey uh, that she is engaged in. She's learning continuously. Uh, and as she's traveling, she's also writing. So she writes in Marathi and she writes back uh, articles which are published in Marathi in, um, in, um, uh, back in, uh, at home. And in many of these letters, she describes uh, travels, she describes people whom she meets and so on. So again, she's deploying writing. And then she writes this very powerful book, which is called The High Caste Hindu Woman. That's, a, that's her sort of classic. Um, it's a sort of counter to the Manu Dharma Shastra. But it, it is focused particularly on women. And she progressively, like the you know, like Manu will, uh, Manu and the Brahmins will con divide human beings' li um, life span into four stages. You know, the uh, student, uh, then the Grahastha, uh, then the Vanaprastha, and then the Sanyasi. Um, she also uses that same model uh, by talking about the young girl child, then the married woman, then the mother, and finally the widow. So she also, and as she proceeds, she escalates, she increases the burden of exploitation and oppression of women as they grow from childhood to motherhood, uh, to, uh, to wifehood, to uh, motherhood and to widowhood. So it's quite uh, powerful. And she actually does a very interesting way in which she puts the rules for the widower as derived from a Manu, against the rules for widows, also derived from Manu, she puts them together and you can see immediately the double standard of sexual morality because the rules say, after uh, a man has burnt his wife of equal status, he goes, she goes, he goes home, he observes the mourning period of 13 days, and then he remarries and relights the Grahastha fires, for which you need a wife. Huh? And so, he remarries immediately. And while many chapters in another place, uh, Manu is describing the rules for the widows, um, what Ramabai does is to put those two texts next to each other. And you can immediately see the double standard of sexual morality. But for the woman, it says, and then uh, uh, her, uh, she gives up on this business. And she must never, never raise the name of another man. I mean, like, so she does. She play. She uh, she does this artful juxtaposition of the rules for the man for the man, along with the rules for the woman, and uh, she's making clear to you uh, what it means to be a woman uh, in India. In, and she's made it very clear. It's the high caste Hindu woman who's actually oppressed the the way uh, she is. So it's um, that piece of writing is something that she does. It sells. Um, she all of this is meant to be money that she accumulates to go back and open the uh, home for widows in uh, uh, in Maharashtra. Now, I don't have the time to actually go into the details of this, but when she returns, um, apart from getting into controversies, uh, because she uh, refuses to say that her, her children, the girls in her school, uh, uh, um, cannot convert to Christianity if they want to. She says, I'm not telling them to, but I'm not closing the doors when I uh, read the Bible. And if they choose to become whatever they do, that, then that's their choice. But she gets into terrible controversy and she's shunned by the reformers. They completely uh, throw her out over there. Uh, Tilak and so on are hysterical. Um, so there is this conservative lobby that's against her. But Ramabai quietly does continue to do her own work. There's a lot of struggle. She does continue to do her own work. And when the next round of the famine comes, in her, when she is running this institution, she actually travels to um, central India where the, where the, the, uh, the famine is terrible. And she brings back hundreds of children from there to her institution in, uh, in Pune. Uh, the Pune municipalities outraged, the Puna Brahmins around her are outraged and say, what is this with the rubbish 
all these uh, you know rural types being brought in, people being brought in, and uh, they appeal to the municipality to get rid of those children. And Ramabai just turns around and says, "Okay, she has a piece of land outside, some sixty kilometers away from Pune. She just shifts all of these children to uh, and her own institution to those sixty kilometers away." And starts off the Sharda Southern, uh, sorry, the what is it called? Mukti, Mukti Southern. She sets up the Mukti Southern there, and she sets up. And it's a very interesting experiment because her her girls are in that institution. They are trained to do everything, including weaving and um, and uh, gardening.